This video is supported by Brilliant.org. The year is 1607, and you have a pounding migraine headache. Luckily, you're a member of the nobility, and you actually have access to a doctor. So you summon the doctor, he comes around, checks all your orifices, and then he gives you a prescription for a walnut. Why a walnut? Because it kind of looks like a brain. Somehow, this walnut doesn't help, and then you find that the pain spreads to your tooth. So the doctor comes around again, and this time he makes a tea out of the cardamine plant. Why the cardamine plant? Because its white buds kind of look like teeth. This likewise does nothing to relieve the complaint, and next thing you know, you're coughing up blood. So now the doctor asks you to eat some of the roots of the pulmonaria plant. Guess why? But luckily for you, this works, except it totally f***ing doesn't work because that's crazy. So in a last ditch effort, the doctor pulls out a knife, slices open an artery, and relieves you of all of your pesky blood. And you die. Medicine. This whole treatment because it looks like the thing we're treating thing was real, and it was based off of something called the Doctrine of Signatures. It was an idea first put forward by Swiss physician and alchemist Paracelsus, and the idea is, of course, these plants look this way because God that God gave these plants signatures to tell us that those are treatments for certain conditions. And they believe this for hundreds of years. In fact, that's how a lot of these plants got their names. That cardamine plant I mentioned earlier goes by another name, toothwort. The pulmonaria plant also went by lungwort. There's also liverwort, spleenwort, woundwort, and eyebright. I mean, it kind of makes sense in the understanding of the time, and plants do have some medicinal qualities to them, but not for the reasons that they thought it did. That's just bonkers. This was the world before antibiotics. And according to some people, it's a world we're returning to. Fast. I did a video a while back about people who died from extremely small injuries, and almost all of them had a similar theme to them. They were all just bacterial infections. And this was the reality for most of human history. No matter how big or rich or strong or powerful you were, just the smallest wound could be a death sentence. Lo, for the mightiest kings can be brought to dust by the smallest of all creatures. There's sort of a poetry to it. Yeah, poetry. Let's go with that. And that's why I always say time travel sounds awesome, but if you want to go back before 1928, just, yeah, you have fun with that. Because 1928 was the year that Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, famously by accident. He accidentally left some petri dishes out while he was traveling, and when he got back, he noticed that one of the dishes had grown some mold on it, and no bacteria was growing anywhere near that mold. And he discovered that that mold was killing the bacteria, and antibiotics were born. It would probably be impossible to calculate how many millions of people have been saved by that one accidental discovery. Not to mention peace of mind, you know. Now I know that if I trip and fall in drunken stupor, I don't have to, you know, fear for my life. The thing is, though, we even knew back then that this came with an expiration date. And that's because of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance uh, really essentially is just evolution. It's just really that simple. Bacteria are tiny one-celled organisms and they propagate in the billions when they find a suitable habitat. And when you get that many billions of organisms running around, eventually one of them is going to have a mutation in some way. It happens all the time. And these mutations lead to any number of tiny changes. Some that might not make any difference at all, some that might make a big difference. Like a resistance to certain types of antibiotics. And really this has been happening this whole time. Antibiotics manufacturers are playing this never-ending game of whack-a-mole, just constantly trying to beat the latest antibiotic-resistant strain of bacteria. That's par for the course. That we've been managing pretty well for the last 91 years. That's not something that worries researchers. What worries researchers is the rise of what they call pan-resistant bacteria. These are bacteria that are resistant to all types of antibiotics, the superbugs, if you will. And this is where old school viewers of this channel know that it's time to unpack that good old existential angst because those superbugs, they're here. In August of 2016, a 70-year-old woman was admitted to the hospital in Reno, Nevada with a bacterial infection in her hip. And this bacteria was identified as a particularly bad strain of what's called a Carpobenum-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CREs. They tried the traditional treatments of CRE, which is tetracycline and cholistine. Neither of those worked, so they moved on to other treatments. The team at the hospital continued testing out different types of antibiotics, 26 in all, one at a time, and none of them worked. Ultimately, she died three weeks later of sepsis. 
This was the first recorded case of a truly pan-resistant bacteria that was just immune to everything we threw at it. But it's not the only concerning case. In fact, there's a strain of Salmonella that's been shown to be resistant to all types of antibiotics except for three. And then in 2016, it evolved to be resistant to one of those three. So now there's only two that it responds to. It should be noted that even typical Salmonella kills over 200,000 people every year. Tuberculosis, one of the biggest killers in human history, is starting to make a comeback, with 13% of reporting cases showing multi-drug resistance. There are nearly 10,000 cases a year of drug-resistant pneumonia reported, including a case in 2016 that was resistant to all 26 antibacterial treatments. There's even been a minor case of super gonorrhea in Australia. Insert down under joke here. How did this happen? Well, any use of antibiotics, even small use of antibiotics, is gonna lead to drug-resistant strains of bacteria, but, this is the human race we're talking about here, whose motto is, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Overuse of antibiotics has been rife in the medical profession for quite some time now, but in the last 20 or 30 years, it's become an industrialized process. Antibiotics are used extensively in the meat industry, for example, and antibiotics, soap, and hand sanitizers have really helped to weed out the competition by all the weak bacteria so that the stronger bacteria can thrive. There's also the problem of doctors overprescribing antibiotics to patients. Most common colds and infections that we have, our body's immune system is strong enough to weed it out, but doctors prescribe antibiotics just to make it go away a little bit faster. And yeah, as a doctor, you want your patient to feel better faster, that's understandable, but often doctors have been prescribing antibiotics for conditions that they know it won't even help, like a viral infection, just because the patient insists on it, or the doctor might just be, you know, relying on the placebo effect. In recent years, however, there's been a big push for doctors to lighten up on the antibiotic prescriptions that they run, so they might be more willing to just prescribe some rest and maybe some drugs to kind of help deal with the system symptoms while you heal yourself. Turns out that getting an infection from time to time and exposure to pathogens is actually kind of good for the body, which kind of goes to a much bigger issue. You know, as, as humans, we spent a lot of time in our history removing ourselves from nature. We put ourselves in buildings with air conditioning. We sanitize and sterilize everything. We change the environment to fit us. And we're definitely a lot healthier and happier because of it. But is it good for us in the long run? And we, we evolved in nature. That's kind of where we're supposed to be. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be moving into a cave anytime soon. But you do kind of have to ask the question, are we doing more harm than good here? The fact is we're definitely living longer, healthier lives than ever before, but there are some interesting outcomes to this. Antibiotic resistance is just one of them. Then there's the case of peanut and tree allergies and the increase in autism rates over the years. And while research is ongoing in all of these cases, uh, some studies show that exposure is actually a good thing, that children who are exposed to peanut butter before six months of age actually have fewer cases of peanut allergies than otherwise. And it's likely that there's some kind of environmental factor that's increasing autism rates. What that is, we don't know. We do know what it's not. And none of this is anything new. There's a long history of environmental factors that have caused health problems from asbestos to lead-based paint to arsenic and makeup. Humans are always coming up with new creative ways to poison ourselves. With every advancement, there are trade-offs and backfire effects. In the case of antibiotics, there's drug-resistant bacteria. Our understanding of disease and how we treated those diseases have gone through several phases. Phase one was guided by mysticism and superstition. People got sick and died because the gods smited them. Phase two was guided by the four humors and the doctrine of signatures. Totally insane, but made sense in the context of the time. Phase three is when we finally understood the germ theory of medicine and learned how to sterilize and contain transmission. Phase four is the age of antibiotics, which we've been in for the last hundred years or so, blissfully unencumbered by the impending doom threatened upon us by bacterial infections. And soon we may slide inexorably into a fifth stage, a post-antibiotic stage, a stage defined by superbugs that are completely resistant to any kind of treatment available. Now this doesn't mean we're completely screwed, and we're definitely not as doomed as our ancestors were. We have a much better understanding of medicine now than they did back then. We have better ways of containing these kinds of bacterial infections. We have better ways of keeping them from spreading from one person to another. And as some studies have found, these mutations that are causing these bacteria to become drug resistant seem to hamper their ability to transfer from one person to another sometimes. And ironically, some of the treatments we may have to rely on look a lot like the treatments from antiquity. In a paper titled Treatment Options in a Post-Antibiotic World, posted last year, the researchers led by Dr. Robert Richard Bragg discussed several options we may have to rely on when the antibiotics stop working. 
treatments like advanced immunotherapy and bacteriophages, vaccines, and biosecurity measures. But they also discuss options like herbal therapies and essential oils, which do have some medical benefit. It's just not because they look like a certain thing. I'll put a link to that paper in the description if you want to know more. The bottom line is in a post-antibiotic world, your survival will depend a lot more on probability than it ever has before. So if you want to learn more about probability, one place to do that is a probability course on Brilliant.org. That's a segue. Brilliant.org is an online learning platform with a twist. Instead of making you memorize facts and figures, they walk you through a series of problems, helping you to figure it out on your own so you can conceptualize it in the way that makes the most sense to you. In short, they help you to think like a scientist. They have courses in math from the basics to multivariable calculus, science, computer theory, and yes, probability, and even games of chance. You can be a better gambler because of Brilliant. They also have a daily challenges feature that gives you a random problem to solve every day to help you create a daily learning habit. Viewers of this channel can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe and get free access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And those who sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses, including the daily problems, can get 20% off your subscription for life. It's really worth checking out if you haven't. Even the free stuff is really cool. So uh, brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe, links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that help keep this thing moving, who are helping me to grow a team around this and are just having some awesome discussions. I just like talking to you guys. There's some new people who have joined the tribe. Let me murder their names real quick. We got John Jameson, uh, James Fitch, Paul Hackett, Brian Wakeley, Mike Kruger, Colton Mass, Mass, uh, Jared Fuzz, Dakota Flemmer, who has been awesome in our community, uh, Daniel Meyer, uh, Matthias Iverson, Cultus, F. Rob Dorsey, and Gary Wiseman, who I met when I was in Florida last week. It was great meeting you. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to early uh, videos and just behind the scenes stuff and me in various uh, live streams and stuff like that, you can go to patreon.org or patreon.com slash answerswithjoe.com. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this one. I invite you to check that one out or any of the others that might show up on the sidebar over here. And if you like those, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and Thursday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.